And that's what we celebrate this morning. We celebrate the cross. We celebrate the victory we have in Christ. We celebrate what he's done for us. We celebrate the love he's shown us. And it humbles us. And when you reflect upon the cross, it makes you realize how valuable you are to him. And it makes you realize that the agendas that you you work for, you push for, you spend all of your time and, and effort and energy gaining stuff and things and, and living for pleasures, his death makes us realize that there's a whole better thing we ought to be living for, right? And that is the pleasure of his will. Uh, he is a mighty, wonderful Savior to us, and it is a marvel that he would call little old us into uh, life with him into a relationship with him and, and draw us into worshiping him. I pray that you're worshiping here, him this morning. Open your Bibles back to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 14 through 21. We'll read a few of these verses here, and then we'll begin our study together in God's word. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and starting in verse 14, says, I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you. For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you, imitate me. For this reason, I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. Let's stop there for a moment. The main point that I want you to see this morning as we dive into this passage together, as we look at God's word and apply it to ourselves, the main thing I want you to see is that ministry is most effective in the context of a relationship. Ministry is most effective in the context of a relationship. I remember one time that I was a youth pastor uh, in Ames. And I uh, had got a little bit of a chip on my shoulders. I was a little bit puffed up in my attitude. And I know a lot of you can't imagine me that way, right? And uh, I decided I was going to skip church one Sunday. But I wasn't going to tell anybody. I was just going to show up for the first couple of minutes, shake some hands, and then slip out and, and not go to church that day. I had something else that I had to do that was important to me. And, uh, and so, I, so I did that. I went and I, I slipped away without anybody realizing it. The pastor, my boss, I was on staff as a youth pastor, he caught wind of this, and so he wanted to rebuke me because I shouldn't be trying to be deceitful and sneak out of church. And I didn't see it as a big deal because, again, my attitude was kind of wonky. It was kind of astray. And so what he did is he took, he invited me out for lunch, and he took me to a really fancy restaurant. It was a type of restaurant I wouldn't normally eat at because it was expensive. He bought my meal. He said I could order whatever I wanted, and after a loving conversation about the church, after we were done eating, we got down to business, and he said, I wanted to know why it, you think it's okay for you to skip church. You know what we expect out of you? He showed me how my attitude was leading to my behavior, and my attitude was wrong, and I wasn't uh, thinking of what's best for the church and what's best for the people that I'm ministering to. And when I realized his love for me and that he was lovingly rebuking me in the context of this relationship, I was deeply impacted. And I remember weeping at that uh, meal because I didn't realize how far I was from God in my attitude. I was calloused. I was puffed up. And if it wasn't for his loving rebuke, his loving restoration, I would not have realized this. If you want to lead somebody to the Lord, if you want to disciple others, if you want to do ministry in other people's lives, it is always best to teach them from a position of a loving relationship. Think about this. When someone comes to you and they want to change your behavior and they were to sit you down in a chair and they were to lecture you for an hour like a professor... Would you appreciate that approach? 
Or even worse, if they were to shame you or guilt you and tell you that there's something wrong with you and that normal good people don't act that way and they use the tools of guilt and shame and bad feelings about yourself to get you to change your behavior, would you appreciate that approach? But if someone you know and you know loves you and shows you the truth about how your behavior can easily get out of hand, can really lead you astray. They show you how your behavior is negatively affecting the people around you, and they just want to see you live a happy, satisfied life in Christ. They explain it to you in a loving way. They have a track record of having your best interest in mind. You can trust their instruction. Would you not appreciate that approach so much more? In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 14, here we see the heart of a loving encourager. We see the heart of a loving disciple maker. Paul is showing his affection for the church in a way that we should emulate in the lives of the people that God has given us to influence. Before we break this passage down and go over what it's saying, I want you to do something. I want you to write down the names of one or two or three people in your bulletin or on your phone or somewhere Write down the names of one or two or three people that God has given you the ability to influence. Uh, God intentionally puts people in your life for you to influence them. God intentionally puts you in the path of other people for you to influence them. Right now, I want you to write down one or two or three names of people that you are influential over. Could be a coworker, could be a friend, could be a family member. But I want you to write down three people that you are in a position to influence. It doesn't have to be somebody younger. It could be a friend. It could be a peer. But think of one or two or three people that God has given you to influence. And then as we go through this passage, I want us to ask ourselves the question, are we influencing them in a loving way with the same loving heart that Paul has as he influences the church in Corinth? Just to remind you of where we're at in 1 Corinthians, we've been going through this uh, passage by passage for the past several weeks. Uh, chapters 3 and chapter 4 are a rebuke to the Corinthian people. They were dividing into factions, they were dividing into uh, little, uh, little cults, kind of like. Some were saying that they were of Apollos, some were saying that they were of Apollos, some were saying they were of Cephas. They were being puffed up. They were insulting one another. The church was having divisions. And in the last passage that we looked at last week, uh, verses 6 through 13, Paul gets really snarky and even sarcastic with them. He says, you guys are kings. You're so wise. Us disciples, us apostles, we're, we're the offscoring of the world. We're the filth of the world. We're, we're the slaves. We're the servants. But you guys, you have it made. You have it all figured out. You are rulers, and we're just, we're just slaves. And what he was doing is he was using some Pauline sarcasm to uh, get them to see that they were thinking of themselves way more highly than he ought to think. For chapter 3 and most of chapter 4 is a pretty stern rebuke to this Corinthian church. And then passages, uh, verses 14 through 21 are, is Paul's PS, his reminder that he loves them. He says, yes, I'm rebuking you, you deserve it, you're, you're off your rocker a little bit, but I want to remind you that I love you. And so he reminds them in verse 14 and in verse 21 that he loves them, that he's approaching them from a position of love. Paul gives them a stern rebuke, and at the end of that rebuke, he gives them a reminder of his love for them and then points them to the truth. Ministry and the context of a relationship. Verse 14, he says, I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you. I don't write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you. So Paul sees himself as a father to these people. Just to remind you, Paul spent a year and a half in Corinth. He led many of these people to the Lord, and he taught them to lead many other people to the Lord and make disciples of Christ in Corinth. He birthed this church. Well, the Holy Spirit did, God did, but he used Paul to do that. 
And so as a person that has, is so entrenched in their lives, he has a great deal of love and affection for them still. And he reminds them, as he rebukes them, that he loves you, loves them, loves the church. He says, I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you. Let's look at the difference between those two words, shame and warn. The word shame in the Greek is entropon, and it means to create inside of a person a feeling of wrongness about themselves. In other words, eliciting feelings to turn a person against themselves. Feelings that testify about themselves that they have done wrong. Feelings of shame. I remember when I was in uh, Bible college, I had a professor named Dr. Bob. Dr. Bob Domikos. And Dr. Bob was a a wonderful, kindly grandpa to the students. He was a, a loving guy. He had a real heart for people. And we were in a class called homiletics, which is the study of preaching, how to preach. And so he was sharing an an embarrassing moment that he had in his church where he was preaching a sermon. And he used uh, used a, a sermon illustration. He used the phrase, a boy sitting under a shade tree. But as it came out of his mouth, the words and the, the words got all jumbled up and prefixes became suffixes. And what he said, instead of saying a boy was sitting under a shade tree, he said something very different, as you can imagine. Uh, all of a sudden, he heard his, his congregation start to snicker and laugh. And then he realized his mistake. He realized that he had said something inappropriate in the pulpit. And he said, all at once, I had this This heat wash all the way through my body. He had this feeling of shame and embarrassment. That feeling, and you felt like that too. It's like when all your your innards get sucked up into your chest, right? And you know that you did wrong. That feeling is there to remind you that, that you did something wrong. Some people approach instructing others through the approach of shame alone. Think of a mother who seems to have one tool in her toolbox, which is guilt and shame. She uses it to change her child's behavior. She catches them doing something wrong, so she repeatedly tells them that they are worthless and there's something wrong with them, that they will never make something of themselves. She uses name-calling. You're a pervert. You're a liar. You're a thief. And what she is trying to do is inflame inside of them feelings of shame so intensely that they won't behave that way again. The problem with that is shame only leads to temporary change. Once the feelings of shame are gone, the behavior returns and the heart is not changed. They may obey temporarily, but they don't actually change. Some of you had parents like that. And you know that that sort of uh, approach does not work. It doesn't lead to lasting change. It leads to resentment and pain. Unfortunately, the child will grow up sometimes genuinely thinking that there's something wrong with them. Paul isn't trying to just elicit in these people feelings of shame. He wants to warn them. Contrast that approach with warning someone. Paul says in verse 14, he's trying to warn them as beloved children. The word warn means to explain the truth to somebody. They don't see the error of their ways. They don't see what's wrong with their behavior. They don't see how their their attitude is wrong and how that can lead to other problems. They don't see how destructive sin can be. They don't see fully that when when that sin is full-blown, it can lead to deep disunity between them and God. They don't see the whole picture. So you sit them down, and out of love, you warn them that their behavior can get out of hand. Sin is attractive. Sin is magnetic. But when it is full-blown, the Bible says it leads to death. And so the approach of warning is so much more effective. I want you to change because I don't want you to stay in the sin that you are ensnared in and the consequences and results of that. One approach uses no love at all, the other is done out of love. So Paul distinctly says he's approaching them as beloved children. 
He is ministering to them in the context of love, in the context of a relationship. I think we could stop here and ask ourselves in the lives of the people that God has given you to influence, the lives of the people that are on your list, how are you approaching them? Are you approaching them as beloved people, people that you just want to see them live a happy and satisfied life in Christ? How are you approaching them? Paul says in verse 15, if you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers, for in Christ I have begotten you through the gospel. He says you can have 10,000 instructors in Christ. So the word, the the number 10,000 is a euphemism for a number that's beyond counting. In the Greek, when you see that word 10,000, it means a word that you can't count. It's a giant multitude. He said you can have an infinite amount of instructors that come at you, make a, a lesson, make a sermon, make a presentation, but they don't have what a father has, which is love. The difference is love. You can have 10,000 preachers walk through our church and give sermon after sermon after sermon, but it won't go as far as one loving relationship in your life that warns you about your sin. He says you can have 10,000 instructors in Christ, but you do not have a father. The difference between an instructor and a father is love. Jesus said they will know you are my disciples by your what? By your love, right? The approach that we take with people in the lives of people that we want to influence. The, the approach we take is a loving approach. A, a father or a mother or a friend or a brother or a sister. Not talking down at people, but lifting them up with the words of Scripture, with the gospel. And this is who God has called you to be. This is who God has called me to be. God has called us to be brothers and sisters, loving people to Christ in our lives. Who are your neighbors? Who are your friends? Who are your family members? When you think about people that you can influence, what is your relationship with them like? Are you approaching them out of love? Are you accomplishing something for the gospel in their life? Whether they're saved or not, they need Jesus. They need to rest in Jesus. And you and I are to be the example of Jesus to them. That's why Paul says in in verse 16, he says, Therefore I urge you, imitate me. He's saying, do what I do. As I lovingly warn you, church in Corinth, imitate me in the lives of other people that God has given you to influence them. This is who God wants you to be in the lives of other people. God very intentionally orchestrates people in the path of your life so that you can love them to Christ. Every single one of us needs to be discipling other people. We need to be building relationships with non-believers to love them to Christ. We need to be praying for our one, looking for ways to love them to Christ, looking for opportunities to, to love them, to serve them, to share the gospel with them, and to teach them the truth of God's word. The Great Commission is your commission. This is you going into the world, commissioned like a missionary, And your marching orders are to make disciples and teach them to observe all things that I have commanded you. This is not an option. This is not something that is reserved for some Christians that are better Christians than other Christians. It doesn't matter the models that you've had before in the past and in your parents or other pastors or other church leaders. This is your commission. This is why you were created. And Paul says, as you go, imitate me, in verse 16. Imitate for people the love of Christ. Serve them, lift them up, uh, love them, build relationships with them. Look at your list this morning. The list of those people that you wrote down. Or you kept in your mind if you didn't write them down. Are you imitating Christ for those people? Paul says, imitate me and he he says elsewhere in scripture imitate me as i imitate christ are you imitating christ for those people 
not in a facade of Christianity pretending to be perfect, but loving them the way that Christ loves them and actually actively having their best interests in your mind. You don't want to control them in order to get something from them the way that everybody else does in their life, but you want to point them to the true lover of their souls so they can be happy, so they can find rest, so they can find the grace that you have found in Christ. Are you imitating Christ for others? Are you pointing people to the gospel? Paul says, imitate me. This is one of the shortest verses in the Bible, verse 16. Therefore, I urge you, imitate me. Live a life worth imitating. Who are you imitating Christ for? If the answer is nobody, then are you fulfilling the Great Commission? 2 Corinthians 2.15, Paul tells us, that we are the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. He says, you are the aroma of Christ to God in the midst of a world that is being saved and the world that is perishing. To both groups of people, the saved and the perishing, you are the aroma of Christ. You are the fragrance of Christ. In other words, they should smell Christ on you, right? It's the same idea as you are the salt of the world. You are what makes the world have its flavor to God. You are what God is concerned about in the world. And so when you interact with the world, do they see Christ in you? Do they smell Christ on you, so to speak? This past uh, week, I was at my father-in-law's house my father-in-law lives in Roland, and uh, he, he's a wonderful guy. He lives by himself. He recently sold his old house, and while he was staging his house, he discovered Glade plug-in air fresheners. Anybody familiar with Glade plug-in air fresheners? And he loves them, and so he puts them all over his house. He'll have a small room. There'll be like two or three in there. It's potent. You walk in there, it's like, like walking into a perfume bottle. And I'm not, not, you know, when I'm his age, I'm going to do whatever I want, no matter what my kids tell me to do. And I can't wait for that. And I, so I'm not disparaging him. He just loves these Glade plug-in air fresheners. And so I was with my brother-in-law, and he was at uh, his dad's, my father-in-law's house. And uh, I gave him a hug, and I could smell Craig's house on his clothes. I said, oh, you must have been at Craig's house. I can smell it on your clothes. And then when I left there, the Glade plug-in air freshener smell was on my clothes. And people could tell where I've been, that I've been with my father because of the smell that's on me. Do people smell your father on you? You are the fragrance of Christ in the midst of those who are being saved, that's the church, and those who are perishing. You are to be an example to those people. When people are around you, do they see your life in Christ? Do they see your love? Do they see your affection? Do they see you imitating Christ for their benefit? Do they smell Christ on you? We walk around in life and around people that are saved, around people that are not saved, people that are going to hell, and we need to imitate Christ for them. We need to look at every single person as an opportunity to minister to them, to be a good example or a bad example, hopefully a good example to them. And, and so you might, have to, you might have to change some of your behavior, some of your attitudes towards your neighbors, towards your family, towards your friends, towards those people that are on your list in order to imitate Christ to them, in order to actively, intentionally being the fragrance of Christ to those people. You may have to change everything about yourself. If you have to change your entire personality, come out of your comfort zone, get comfortable with being uncomfortable, sharing the gospel, inviting people to your house when you don't feel like being around people, uh, sharing the, 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 the produce of your garden, sharing your, your car, your rides, your resources, whatever it is, when you don't feel like doing those things. If you have to change everything about yourself in order to be a disciple maker, in order to imitate Christ for them, then praise God. That's wonderful. When you think of what Christ 
did to win you. How far Christ went to win you. Did Christ have to go outside of his comfort zone? Did Christ have to go far out of his way to pay for your sin? When you think of what he did for you, when you think of the faithfulness of the people that led you to the Lord, you should want to be that to other people. Look at verse 1 of chapter 4 with me. He says, Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. The mysteries of God is the gospel. We are to be stewards of the gospel. That means we are intentionally maintaining a gospel example, a gospel ministry, a, a gospel influence in the lives of who? Of everybody, right? There's not a single person that doesn't fall into the, one of these two categories of being saved or perishing. That you are not to be the fragrance of Christ to. Everybody that you come in contact with is a divine orchestration but the people you live around, the people you see regularly, the people that you're building relationships with. We got to be building those redemptive relationships so that we can share the gospel. Isn't it more comfortable when someone comes at you with the approach of, I love you, I want to share with you what, what makes me happy, what my joy is, and that is Christ. Rather than saying, hey, come to church and listen to what this guy you don't know says about Christ. Isn't it better to build a relationship with those people? And in those natural rhythms of life, where you, you just happen to meet somebody, you just happen to be at somebody's house, you just happen to be chatting with somebody, that is, who, that is how God gets your attention on the people he wants you to influence. Who's on your list this morning? Who are you influencing? Are you imitating Christ to them? Are you the fragrance of Christ among those people? Every interaction is an opportunity to, to be, have a loving attitude, to love on people, to serve, even to share the gospel. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is why we were created to begin with. Ephesians 2.10, Paul says, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. We are his worksmanship. He has fashioned us. You think of a, of a blacksmith hammering on a piece of iron until it's just the right shape. That is who you are to God. He is working in you, creating you to be his workman. Created for good works. That is gospel works. That is the ministry. That is, that is working for his kingdom. He created you for this. This is the reason that you were born, the reason why you were saved, the reason why you have air in your lungs right now, the reason why he continues to bless you is to point you to these good works so that you can walk in them, walk in those works. And they're all, according to this passage, divine orchestrations by God. God prepared beforehand those works for you to walk in. This is why you exist. This is your purpose. The reason for, that you are created is for the spread of the gospel. And if your efforts are not being made for Christ, if you're living simply for your own agenda like these Corinthian people were, they were puffed up, they saw themselves as kings, they saw themselves as wise, they were only concerned about their agenda for their life. If that's you, then chapter 4, verse 1, are you being a good steward of the, the mysteries of God? Are you stewarding the gospel well? And if the answer is no, the solution isn't to just have a bunch of feelings of guilt and shame that don't get us anywhere. I don't care if you feel guilty or bad about yourselves. That's not the point. The point is there's a better way to live and resting in Christ and rejoicing in his grace and rejoicing in his righteousness every day and pointing other people to the same joy, the same love, the same grace that you have. And that purpose is a satisfying purpose. It really is. To love people the way Christ loved you, to point them to the same grace that so warms your heart, that satisfies us. 
living for ourselves, living for our own uh, pleasures, our own agendas, living for the accumulation of our own wealth, and not wanting to be around other people, that does not satisfy the heart. But when we step out in faith and live for him, we find that we live the way we're designed to live. We live the, the best life possible, which is a life lived for Christ. Are you a steward of the mystery of God this morning? He says, imitate me, verse 16, as I imitate Christ. Who are you imitating Christ for in your life? Those people on your list, are you imitating Christ for them? I want to be a good example for the church, and I want to find people that I can uh, build a redemptive, loving relationship with. And so I, I have to be creative sometimes. I have to go out of my way in order to, to, to find uh, relationships. I, I joined the, the, the fire department in Dyke in order to just learn people's names and, and build relationships with people. I have made almost zero friends on the fire department to this date. And I've been on there like two years. You know that? But that's okay. God's in charge, laying the groundwork, trying to be a good example. Time will will help those things along. This past week, I had my brother-in-law at our house. He stayed with us for a few days. He's from California. And my daughter, Katie, wanted to show him uh, her archery set, the bow and arrow that she owns. And so they were in the backyard, and we set this target up next to my neighbor's fence, and we put this board behind the target just in case somebody misses the target. It wouldn't pierce the neighbor's fence. Uh, but it was the only place that we had in our limited property to, to do this. So my brother-in-law picks up the bow and arrow, and he points it, and he shoots, and it misses the target, misses the large board behind it, and goes right through the neighbor's fence, all the way through the neighbor's fence. Puts this tiny hole, just the size of an arrow. It's like three uh, sixteenths of, of a hole in the neighbor's fence. And it's not a big deal, but I've barely had any interaction with that neighbor. So I said, I'm going to fix that hole in the fence, and I... I found a dowel that would fit in there, and I cut it to size, and I drilled, and I, uh, and I put it in, I glued it in, and then I went to my neighbor's house to tell them that I pierced their fence, and I was apologetic, and I wanted to fix it. They weren't home when I went over there, but I fixed the fence. Now, the fence is like a dilapidated old cedar fence, and, and it, it, they probably wouldn't even notice, but hopefully I can get an interaction with them, and they would see, hey, this is a nice guy. He did something a little... Uh, wrong, and he's fixing it. And that's what I want. I want them to see, hey, there's a nice guy there. There's somebody that has their best interest in mind. And then hopefully later I can point them to Christ. And then when I was fixing that neighbor's fence, one of my other neighbors named Velma, who's an organist at the Methodist Church, she invites me into her house to get some of the produce from her garden, some tomatoes that she had. She had an abundance of tomatoes. She said, I heard that you gave some sweet corn to our other neighbor named Carrie. And uh, Paul Klingenborg was here a few days ago and gave me some extra sweet corn. So I gave it to one of my neighbors. Another neighbor heard about that interaction and invited me into her house to, to give me some produce. And it's like we're sharing this, this relationship based upon produce, but it's because I stepped out of my comfort zone and knocked on their door and wanted to give them some of the ways that I've been blessed, give them some produce of our gardens as well. Or your garden, I should say, not mine. <clears throat> and so uh, I want to have all these positive interactions so that when the rubber meets the road in life and when they go through a crisis or when they need truth, that I can have that, that, that uh, experience of a relationship with them that I might be able to point them to Christ, that I might be able to share the gospel with them. I talked to my wife this week about how uh, all our neighbors are sharing produce together. And, and even though her and I both hate gardening because we're terrible at it, we're going to start a garden next spring simply for the purpose of giving away produce. So if you're a farmer and you have some tips on how to, to grow a garden, uh, I could really use that because I am all thumbs and not green thumbs, but I'm just terrible at it. But I want those interactions with my neighbors. I want those, those positive opportunities to encourage them, to be a blessing to them, so that I can imitate Christ to them. Jesus said in Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. 
We go through life thinking only of our own agenda, only of the things of the earth, accumulating wealth, uh, trying, to, trying to set up our little empire for ourselves. Jesus says, first seek the kingdom of God. Are you working for the kingdom? Are you seeking first the kingdom of God? If not, then you're disobeying this command. Think of the good Samaritan. Jesus gave us the parable of the good Samaritan and said that there was a Samaritan that came across a broken and bleeding person that had been robbed on the road. He nursed him back to health. He, he took him to an inn and gave him some money. And then he says, who is the neighbor to that person? Meanwhile, Jews were stepping over him. The Pharisees were stepping over him and didn't care. And you're not going to come across broken and bleeding people. You're going to come across hurt people. You're going to come across callous people. You're going to come across people that are living fully for their own pleasures, their own agendas. And everybody around them is living fully for their agenda. When you are different, when you can nurse those emotional wounds, when you can build those relationships, when you can help the broken, then you are the good Samaritan in their life. Why? live this way? Why put such effort and energy into seeking people to love? What's our motivation? Christ did all he could to save you. Now go, therefore, and live for him. We just sang three songs about living for Jesus, a life that blesses other people, not because we want people to see us as good people, not because we love these rules and we put on this facade of Christianity, because we genuinely want them to have the love, the grace, the joy, and the rest that we have in Christ. Why live for this this way? Why put such effort into these things? Because of all that Christ has done for you. Our musicians are going to come back. We're going to sing two verses of that song, His Rogues for Mine. And I want you to think upon this morning what Christ has done for you how he paid it all, how he was left accursed for you in order for you to not experience God's wrath. He gave you his righteousness. He gives you his blessing. Now, therefore, we go and live for him. The fragrance of Christ in the world, in the lives of people that we can interact with, the people that we can influence, both the saved and the non-saved are alike. We are Christ to them. Let's sing his robes for mine. Just two verses.